Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the Facera Mid-Career Webinar. We're going to be getting started in just a few minutes, but I just wanted to kind of give a little bit of a background of uh, the webinar today. I'm sure that most of you are going to have questions if they come up during the presentation, and that's great. We want to encourage questions. Um, just make sure that if you are using or if you have any questions, please post that in the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen. I believe it should be. Um, I, I did post a message there earlier saying to use this box there to post any questions that you do have. We will have a retirement specialist in the chat moderating these questions and answering them while the presentation is going on. And then after the presentation is over, time permitting, uh, I will be answering more questions uh, out loud and things. So we are going to be getting started in just a few minutes. So just sit back and relax and uh, thank you for being here. Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to Facera's mid-career webinar. My name is Jared Wong and I am the communications analyst here with Facera. I want to personally thank you, all of you for being here today and taking the first step in learning about your retirement. Um, this webinar is a, has been a long time coming and I'm glad that I'm able to provide this to you today and give you some really good information about your retirement. Now, there is going to be a lot of information discussed in this PowerPoint presentation, so I'm going to be sure that you have questions, and that's good. We want you to have questions. So if you do have a question, there should be a Q&A box to your right of your screen, and I'm sorry, it's like I'm pointing this way. Um, there should be a Q&A function box where you can post your questions. So go ahead and post your questions or comments in that in that box right there. And then I do have a retirement specialist, uh, Donna Lore, in the chat moderating our questions for us. She's going to be answering those questions that you have in real time. And then after the presentation, we will be uh, answering any more questions that you do have if there's time permitting. So um, 
just that, just wanted to let you guys know about that. Now, this webinar today is a mid-career webinar, so it is designed for members in the midst of their career to kind of learn about what our retirement plan is, what are things to look for, how to kind of plan out your retirement. So there's gonna be a lot of good information here. Now, another note here, if you do need to leave early, that's okay. This webinar is actually being recorded, so it will be uploaded for future viewing. So with that said, let's kind of just get started. So here's a look of what is on the agenda for today's webinar. So we're gonna talk about what is Facera, what services do we provide? What is a defined benefit plan, which is your retirement? We're gonna talk about membership investing, retirement eligibility, the different retirement factors and benefit options. We're gonna to touch upon those. We're gonna talk about disability, death benefits, and divorce, the three Ds. Options after terminating employment. And then finally, we're gonna end on a, a little note about financial planning and wellness education. Just some little bit of tips to kind of look out for when you're planning your retirement for that day in the future. Okay, so what is Fresno County Employees Retirement Association? Well, Facera, we are an independent public agency. We are governed by the County Employees Retirement Law of 1937, also known as the CERL. We are also governed by the California Public Employees Pension Reform Act of 2013, which is known as PEPRA. We are a cost-sharing plan that have multiple employers, but most importantly, our retirement plan is called a defined benefit plan. Now, on a couple slides, I'm gonna be explaining to you what that defined benefit plan is. Now, our mission statement here at Facera is to provide secure retirement benefits and quality service to our members and beneficiaries while investing the assets of the plan within prudent levels of risk. So here is a little diagram of how kind of Facera works here. So let's kind of start from the top left. So you should see right there member, which is you and your contributions. So if you probably noticed as um, since this is a mid-career webinar, most of you have at least been a county employee for about five years. You've noticed in your pay stub that you are contributing to retirement every two weeks, every pay period. So that we take that contribution that you contribute every pay period. Now, the employer also contributes into the Vicera Fund on your behalf as well. Now, with those funds are then invested in a variety of investments that earn that get earnings and interest. So we take those three things combined, the member contributions, the employer contributions, and the any investment earnings and interest that we gain from, from our investing, and they are all combined and build this Facera fund, which pays out that defined benefit to our members. Now, let's kind of go into what exactly a defined benefit is and how this impacts you when you retire. So a defined benefit plan is a lifetime benefit based on specific factors. What this really means is that when you meet the requirements for retirement, you'll receive a payment from us every month for the rest of your life. Now, your benefit from Facera is based on specific factors. So one of the things that we look at is your tier level and member classification. And then we take a look at these three other factors in calculating your monthly lifetime benefit. So we look at your age of retirement. Then we look at your salary or what we call your final or I'm, excuse me, I got ahead of myself. We look at your years of service or what we call service credit. And then we look at your salary or what we call final average compensation. Now, we use those three factors there to help calculate what your monthly lifetime benefit will be. Now, members, uh, you must be vested in order to receive a benefit. So you need to be vested in our plan. And I'm gonna be covering vesting in a couple of slides so you know what that means. Now, another thing here, Another benefit of this defined benefit plan outside of everyone that qualifies gets a lifetime benefit. If you happen to be in tiers one through three, this is another added perk to your retirement. You're eligible for a potential cost of living adjustment each year that's approved by our board of retirement. Retirees can receive up to a max of 3% of a cost of living adjustment per year. In order to qualify for that cost of living adjustment, you must be eligible in the eligible tier, excuse me, of tiers one through three, and then you need either, either to be retired or retire on or before April 1st of that current year to receive that COLA. Now, usually the COLA for the year is usually announced in our February board meeting by our board of retirement. So for, for example, for 2021, 
the uh, the board will retire will announce that sometime in February. Now, if you are looking to potentially retire and get a COLA, if you're in one of those eligible tiers, I recommend that you, when you pick a retirement date, you contact our office at least 90 days prior to your retirement date. Um, you may have seen in your office and, or heard amongst other coworkers in the county that that first quarter is really busy in our office. That um, it's the other type of March madness, so to speak, not basketball, but we do have a lot of members that that want to retire and get that call for that year. So our office does get really busy with appointments. So if this is something you plan on doing in the future, we de definitely recommend making an appointment with our office within 90 days of your retirement date. And then um, the counseling session will take place with you in the retirement specials. Okay. So I noticed that uh, uh, there's a little bit more people coming into the to the webinar now that weren't here right at the very beginning. So I just want to kind of backtrack a little bit and just kind of say welcome everybody. Thank you guys for tuning in. And um, if you have any questions during this whole presentation, utilize that question and answer function that's in the webinar. So you're going to ask questions there. Our retirement specialist will be answering those questions for you. And um, after the presentation, we'll be answering more questions out loud and things like that, okay? So the next thing here is membership in Facera. So membership in Facera is mandatory. So everyone that gets hired, you're automatically enrolled in the plan. There's nothing special that you have to do. Now, if you happen to work less than 50% of full time, you are not eligible for membership in Facera. Basically, that means you are not accruing service credit toward receiving a retirement benefit in the future. So contributions are, are taken every pay period, as I mentioned, as you can see in, on your check stubs there. You can, you can definitely check that out and see what you should be or, or what you are contributing into the plan. Okay, I'm sorry guys, hold on. We're just having a little technical difficulties, a little slow here. This is, we're all getting used to this new normal, right? This working from home webinar stuff. So um, anyways, I'm sorry, plan sponsors. So for Sarah, we do have plan sponsors in our plan. We have five plan sponsors. So as you can see on the screen there, we have the County of Fresno, which is our biggest plan sponsor. Superior Courts of California, County of Fresno, Fresno Madera Area Agency on Aging, Fresno Mosquito Vector Control District, and the Clovis Veterans Memorial Memorial District. Okay. So the next thing here that I want to discuss is the next thing here I want to discuss is membership tiers and classifications. So in our plan, we have multiple tiers. The tier level that you are placed in is based on your entry date into the Vicera membership. So like I mentioned before, you can actually find this out on your check stub. You can actually see next to your contributions, it should tell you what tier that you're in. And you were placed in that tier based off of when you, what tier was established when you were hired. For So for example, our latest newest tier is tier five. So anyone that is hired on or before, um, on or, or on or after, excuse me, January 1st of 2013 is placed into our tier five tier. So we also have two memberships in our plan as well we have safety and general members. Safety members have four tiers, tiers one, two, four, and five. General members have tiers one, two, three, four, and five. So if you are in a safety membership, you fall under one of these job classifications. You are the sheriff's officers, correctional officers, DA investigators, firefighters, criminologists, chief of investigations, and deputy sheriffs. Now, general members, it's everybody else. So if you don't see your job title there under that safety there, you are considered a general member. And that is also reflected on your pay stub. So for example, of a couple of positions that are general members, they are account clerks, retirement specialists, staff analysts, office assistants, eligibility workers, and so forth. There's a lot. So you can actually check that stuff out on your, your pay stub there. Okay. 
Okay, so the next thing here is vesting, and this is an important one here. So this is this is how you start accruing your retirement benefit. This is when you know that you are on the right track to start getting a potential lifetime monthly benefit. In order to get some type of payment from Facero, you do need to be vested in your plan. Now, you are fully vested in your pension after five years of service. Once you're vested, you are entitled to a lifetime monthly allowance upon retirement eligibility. Now, on the next slide, I'm going to kind of show you what the retirement eligibility requirements are for different tiers and membership classes. Something that also helps toward vesting is, is called reciprocity. We're going to cover that later on in the presentation because that may apply to some people in this webinar today or it could apply it, it could apply to you all in the future depends we'll go we'll kind of cover that and then finally for vesting this is a this is a milestone as a facera member so this is one of your biggest milestones that you can get as a facera member this shows that you're on the right track toward building that retirement okay so here is a table of the retirement eligibility requirements for each tier. So as you guys can see, I'm sure you probably all have the PDFs that I emailed all of you as well, because it's going to be actually very important because there's going to be some parts of that PDF that I'm going to refer to that uh, will be helpful for you guys after the webinar. So in this table here, this shows the different requirements for retirement. So let's kind of look at that first column there, that generals tier one through four. You if you fall under the general tier one through four, the minimum requirements for retirement is age 50 with 10 years of service or at any age with 30 years of service. Tier five for general, you can retire at a minimum age of 52 with at least five years of service. And then safety tiers one through four or one, two and four, excuse me. Uh, age 50 with 10 years of service, or you can retire at any age with at least 20 years of service. Now, safety tier five is age 50 with at least five years of service. Now, these are just showing you what the minimum requirements to, to retire are. That doesn't mean that you have to retire at that point. These are just the minimum requirements that you can to start drawing a monthly lifetime benefit. Now, if you decide to retire when you hit these marks, that's OK. You can do so now, depending on those statistics or on those numbers that of what you're retiring with, your numbers may your benefit may be a, may be lower if you retired at the minimum compared to if you were to work another five years or so. And we're going to kind of go over that in a little bit here. But just kind of one thing to remember here is that you choose your retirement date. Um, a question that we get asked a lot is, well, what is the best time to retire? Well, frankly, that's something that we can't really answer for you. Um, there's a lot of variables into that. So you have to kind of look at your situation and we're going to cover this too toward the financial planning area at the end of the presentation. But it's kind of like you need to look at your situation, figure out what your benefit is going to be per month. You got to kind of look at the different numbers, like if you were to stay an extra year or if you would wait for the next quarter when you hit a when you get a little bit older would that benefit your benefit things like that the cost of living adjustment things like that there's a bunch of scenarios that can be planned or thought of when trying to decide your retirement date and but that is something that you definitely will choose but you know you can always call our office and ask us to go over these things with you and we can kind of give you give you as much information as you can to help you make that decision for that's best for you OK, so career milestones here. So this is something the next thing here I would like to cover. Um, these are milestones that you will you will see in your career as a member of Facera. Your first milestone, as you can see there on the on the timeline there, is your date of hire. This is basically the first day that you show up to work in your full time retirement eligible position. Now, if you started out as part time or extra help, at that time that you were classified as one of those part time or extra help, you were not eligible to become a member of Facera until you became a permanent full time employee. And then you may be able to purchase that extra help and part time help to add to your retirement. And we'll get to that when we talk about service credit. Now, after your first day of work, your first day of hire, you, you hit your next milestone in two weeks. This is a good one. This is a big one here. At that point, that's when you become an official member of Facera. 
that's when you start earning service credit toward building your retirement. Now, kind of to backtrack a little bit, that first pay period that you were hired, you are not actually a member yet. You have to wait until that second pay period, that first day of that second pay period. Well, we do allow you to purchase that first pay period to add to your years of service when, after you become a member. That will also be discussed later in the presentation under service credit purchase. Now, the next milestone, and one of the most important is vesting. And I mentioned that on a couple of slides ago. Vesting, so you hit that vesting period when you hit five years of service. That's huge because once you hit that five years of service, you are eligible for a monthly lifetime benefit once you meet your retirement eligibility. So the next milestone after that vesting period is will depend on what tier that you're in. So the next milestone is your first eligible retirement date. So as you can see, there's two different dots right there on the screen, two different points on the, on the milestone list there. So the first one there is your first eligible retirement date if you're in tiers one through four for general and safety and, tier, and safety tier five. So if you happen to be in tiers one through four for general and tiers one, two and four for safety, it is age 50 with 10 years of service. Safety tier is age 50 with five years of service. The other, the other milestone there is if you are a general tier five, when you meet your first eligible retirement date of age 52 with five years of service. Now, as I mentioned as previously on the other slide as well, these are just your first eligible dates that you can retire, but doesn't mean you have to. Um, depending on the age, your age and your years of service that you have along with your final compensation, your monthly benefit from, from us will be varied depending on how long you work, how old you are, things of that. All of these factor into how, mu how much your benefit will be when you retire. Finally, that last milestone is when you hit your retirement date. When you choose the retirement date and you end up retiring, that is what you've been working towards this whole time. So. The whole point of this showing you this career milestone is to show the different points of where it in, can impact your career. So learning when you, you are eligible for a benefit as far as drawing and retiring early or knowing when you're vested so then you can start looking and planning and figuring out what your income is going to be when you retire so you can make arrangements to see if everything's going to work out for the dates that you're planning to. Okay, so the next thing here is types of retirement. So in our plan, we offer two types of retirement. We offer service retirements and disability retirement. So service retirement is, is first, and we're gonna cover this over the next couple of slides. This is basically your base re re retirement, your regular retirement. This is what the majority of our members are going to go through when they're ready to retire. Now we do also offer disability retirement as well. We offer two types of disability retirements, what is considered service-connected disability or non-service-connected disability. These two will be briefly discussed also in a later slide. So we're gonna be covering a lot of information here. So I see that I'm just kind of looking at the chat here. There seems to be a lot of good questions here. So thank you guys for, for posting those questions. Keep that up and we'll try and get through as much as, as fast as we can. So let's kind of keep going here. Okay, so the next thing here is service retirement formula. So this is the formula that we use to kind of calculate what your monthly benefit is. After we, we look at what tier and membership class that you're in, we use these three factors that I spoke of earlier when I was kind of explaining what your defined benefit is to calculate your monthly benefit. So we look at your age of retirement, which is the age factor. Then we look at your years of service or service credit as we call it as well. And then final average compensation. We take those three factors together to calculate your monthly benefit. Now, on the next couple of slides, we're gonna be kind of covering what each factor is individually and how they apply to you. And then this is also good to know as well because Instead of having to calculate all this stuff yourself, you can actually do this in our member portal. And then that's also going to be mentioned as well. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but uh, there's a, like I said, there's a lot of information here today that we're going to be covering. Okay, so the first factor with age. Now, if you recall the previous slides about milestones, 
I mentioned about being vested after five years of service and then you the next milestone you hit is when you are meeting the eligibility requirement for retirement. Most of the time that means that you just have to wait until you're old enough to retire, whether that's the minimum age of 50 if you're tiers one or so, or tier five is age 52, as long as you meet that years of service requirement as well. Now, I also mentioned that those are just the minimum requirements that you they, that you have that you can retire. Doesn't mean you have to. Your age can help increase your benefit. So basically, the older you are, the benefit will increase. So your age can help increase your benefit um, as your age all your age factor also increases in quarter year increments. So this is actually something very very interesting that you can look at in our member portal, or you can speak to a retirement specialist about. So because your age does have a factor in your benefit. So I'm going to use the age 50, for example. Age 50, if you were to retire, if you're looking to retire sometime when you turn 50 or maybe a little bit after that, your benefit will be a little bit different if you were to retire right on your 50th birthday or if you were to wait till 50 and a quarter or if you were 50 and a half, your benefit would increase a little bit more because every quarter year increment of your age goes up, your benefit slightly ticks up as well. And then also your benefit's gonna keep increasing as long as you're working because you're accruing more service credits. So here on the slide, I have a little table here, a chart that kind of just shows different member classifications so general tiers one through five and safety tiers one through four or one two four and five these numbers here that you see are the percentage of final compensation at age 55 with 10 years of service so what this basically means here is that if you are age 55 with 10 years of service and you're looking to retire look at each one of those tiers or whatever tier that you fall under so let's say for example that i'm a general tier one member and I'm looking to retire at age 55 and I have 10 years of service. I'm looking at approximately whatever my highest salary is, my final compensation that we use as part of, of our calculation. I'm gonna get 25% of that approximately as my retirement benefit every month for the rest of your life. Now, these are just a little, little examples of just that one scenario of someone being age 55 with 10 years of service. Now, this is another reason I, I said you should kind of keep tabs on that PDF that I emailed all of you is because look at that second, that third bullet point right there on that page. You can view percentage of, our, of all of our final compensation rates in our active members handbook. So in our handbook, we have all these tables for each tier that shows the different scenarios of percentage of what your salary you would get if you were to retire at age 60 with 30 years of service, you know, 55 with 18 years of service and so forth. You can actually look at all that stuff on in our member handbook. You can actually click the link in that PDF that I sent you and it'll take you right to our member handbook to where you can look at those tables right there. It's a really nifty tool to kind of kind of look at, see what percentage of potentially of your highest salary that you will get for your retirement benefit. But as well, you can also look at more, more concrete, accurate data by using using our member portal as well. OK, so the second the second here is service credit. This is the second factor here. So service credit or what we call years of service is basically the time that you earn by working and contributing during your membership. As I mentioned in the career milestones uh, slide there, service credit starts at the date of membership, which is the first day of your second pay period. So that first day, that's when you start accruing your retirement. A lot of people get confused and say, hey, I started at the county two weeks before. Why isn't this? Because you're not a member at that time. You don't become a member of the plan until that first day of that second pay period. That's when you start accruing your retirement benefit. Your service credit is measured in years and you will keep accumulating service credit as long as you're an active employee. Now, the only the, the times that you your service credit will stop and you will stop earning service credit is if you fall under one of these three categories here. So at termination, so if you separate your and leave your employment, you, you stop accruing service credit, goes without saying. If you happen to take a leave of absence where you have no contributions were made during retirement, meaning that if you happen to take a medical leave, for example, or an educational leave or some a personal leave, it doesn't matter what type of leave it is, but you were not getting a check from the county and or if you were getting a check and there wasn't enough in that check to pay contributions to Facera, you were not 
earning service credit for those pay periods that you were out. So that's another instance right there. And then also if employment drops below 50% of full time, if you happen to drop below 50%, then you will not be able to, um, you will not be able to, um, you will not be able to accrue service credit. I'm sorry, I'm sorry guys, I'm having a little bit of like a, you know, I'm a little nervous today. It's the first time I've had to roll this out. So it's a little, our new normal, right? Okay, so that's kind of a little brief about service credit here. The next thing here is service credit purchase. So service credit purchase is something that can be done throughout your career. So what this is, is service credit can be increased if you purchase eligible time during your, um, which can count toward vesting and things of that nature. So service credit can be purchased, like I mentioned, at any point in your career. A um, couple of the examples of what that service credit is, is right here on the screen, as you can see here. Service credit that is available for purchase, the first one is your new hire period. This is one that everybody gets. This is your first pay period of permanent employment working 50% or more of full time. So like I mentioned, you don't become a member of Facera until that first day of that second pay period. But we, so because of that, we allow you to buy that first pay period that you were hired and add that to your retirement. So you can, so that's the first thing that's available to you. The second one is if you were part-time or extra help, that's eligible for purchase. The next one is redeposit of which you're on funds. So what this means is that let's say that I was a former, I, I worked for the county. Let's say I left. I worked there for two years and I left. When I left, I cashed out my retirement. And then let's say a couple years later, I got rehired back on to uh, the county and I became another, I became a member of Facera again. So because I became a member of Facera again and came back to work, I can request to have have calculated what it would cost for me to redeposit those funds that I took out to add back so I could regain the years of service that I lost. Now, the other bullet here, prior public service, this is un this is only for California Superior Courts and special districts. Unfortunately, County, County of Fresno employees are no longer allowed to purchase prior public service. Now, the other ones that are more, a little bit more popular here is leave of absence, medical or military leave. So you, if you happen to take a medical leave, that is eligible to purchase. Military leaves are eligible to purchase as well as long as that leave occurred while you're actively employed. And then the last one here, just as a, because uh, we do get this question a lot, personal and educational leave of absences cannot be purchased. Those are just leaves that well, the, the, the code does not allow us to buy. So the next thing would be then, okay, I have available time. I have a medical leave or I want to purchase my new hire time. How can I do so? Well, the first thing here is you need to complete a service credit calculation form that can be found on our website. Another beauty of this PDF I sent you. If you click on that link right there, that will take you to the website. And it will take you to the form. So let's see, let's look at then the next thing here. So after you fill out that form and you send it to our office, one, uh, our support staff will do the calculation and calculate all available time that, that you have um, as an employee. After that has been completed, you will receive a letter with a quote. Now, just because you receive that letter with a quote and a contract does not mean that you have to buy it. There's no obligation to purchase that. But in that contract, it will tell you what time is available for you to purchase, what, how much is the um, cost going to be, the due date, and then the different payment options. Because depending on certain leaves, you may be able to make payments as far as, for example, you may be able to pay an, a certain dollar amount for 20 pay periods or something like that. That's all going to be broken down in the contract. You can also pay with uh, your service credit purchase with deferred comp. Now, I know I've been mentioning the member portal here, which is it's very important. This is another utilization of the member portal here as well. So if we, you can actually log into the member portal and look to see if you have any available service credit. 
And then you can actually plug into our, our benefit estimator on our portal to see if you were to purchase that time, how much it would help you help your benefit increase. And then if, to see if the purchase is worth the time to do it. So that's also a great perk of the member portal. And um, if you have any questions about service credit, please, you know, just email us, contact our office, speak with a retirement specialist. We'll be happy to help with the with with that. And finally, the third factor of our retirement formula here is final average compensation. Basically, these three big words here mean salary. So as you can see in the little chart right there, depending on your tier, your salary or your final average compensation is calculated differently. So let's look at tiers one and two, for example. If you're in tiers one and two, the way we calculate your high, uh, your final average compensation is we look at your whole career and we pick out the highest 365 consecutive days. That's how we calculate what, uh, and then we, that's how we figure out what your final average compensation is and we use that along with your age of retirement and the years of service that you have to calculate your benefit. So the next one here is tiers three and four. This is the average of the highest three non-year overlapping one year period. So we take your three highest years that are not consecutive and we take the average of them. Tier five is a little different as well. This is the average of your highest consecutive three year period of pensionable compensation. Now, included in your final average compensation, we look at to help calculate what that is with your final comp, we look at your base pay, your highest base pay at that time based off of those schematics right there in that chart, plus any pensionable earn codes that can be added to your final average compensation. I have linked there in the PowerPoint presentation a link to our earn code policy and showing what earn codes are eligible to be added to final average compensation. If you have any questions about this, this final average compensation, what yours is, if you feel like it should be higher, things of that nature, you know, please call our office and speak to a retirement specialist. They will then research your, your account and then get back to you with an answer. Okay. So we've been doing pretty good so far. Um, thank you guys for all just hanging in there. It's, it's a lot of information, right, to soak up. Um, so the next slide here, this is probably one of our most asked questions that we get weekly in our office. Someone will call or email, hey, I want to retire at age 55 or whatever that means. What, what's my benefit going to look like? Well, you can actually do that yourself now. It's, it's, you'll have all this information at your fingertips. It'll be easier. You can have access to this information 24-7, 365. And I'm going to tell you how. I've been plugging this for the last couple of slides, but utilizing the Facera member portal. I can't stress enough how important utilizing this member portal is to your Facera retirement benefit. This is single-handedly your best financial planning tool for your Facera benefit. So, how if you haven't registered for the portal what you need to do is you need to go to our website fresnocountyretirement.org and register you will need a unique what is called a unique identifier to finish completing the registration of your account now we did send out letters to every county employee you know starting when we opened the portal back a few years back up until any new hires but if you just did not get that letter or can't find it that's okay call our office or send us an email from your county email address, and then we can get you that unique identifier to help you complete that registration. So this member portal does a lot of things that are greatly beneficial to you. So first off, you can look at who your beneficiary is. You can view beneficiary information. The big thing there is you can calculate your retirement benefit estimates. So I've been talking about all these factors and age factors, service credit, all these and service credit purchase things, all these things. The member portal will allow you to look at this stuff in real time and you can run estimates of your retirement benefits. So you can see, hey, what if what is the earliest I can retire and what is my benefit going to be? So you can actually put that in earliest retirement date. The portal will then generate what your earliest retirement date is, the amount and the different options that are available to you and with a little bit of explanation of what those options are. Okay, so 
the other thing that you can do in the portal is you can view contribution balances, which is also very, very good. So you can kind of see what you should be contributing into retirement and then see if that matches your pay stub. So we can you that's also something that you can do. Now, the other thing here in the portal is you can also just kind of look at what we have available to you, all your different information. So it is a greatly utilized tool and we're going to keep expanding on it. So if you have not registered for the portal, I recommend you do. Like I mentioned before, this is single handedly your best financial planning tool for your Facera benefit. So here, this is just a screenshot of our website. Um, you can see the arrow right there. Click there to enter the member portal. That's where you can just you go to log in or you can register so you can just um, get everything started and look at your retirement account. OK, so we kind of a little bit talked about service retirements. Now we're going to kind of briefly just discuss disability retirements. So if you become disabled or unable to perform essential functions of your job, you may be eligible for a disability retirement. So you can apply for a disability retirement by completing a disability application that's found on our website. I have linked that application there in the presentation. There are two types of disability retirements that I mentioned earlier, service credit or service credit, excuse me, service connected disability or and non service connected disability. You can also access our disability retirement policy on our website right there. I linked it right there. That a policy will cover the entire process from start to finish. So it is a process. You do need to fill out an application, send that in. The Once the application is, is accepted for processing, a retirement specialist will contact you to schedule an appointment and cover these things with you. And then there's going to be more work, uh, more things to go from there in that process. At the end of the day, the Board of Retirement makes that decision whether to grant you for the disability retirement that you're applying for, whether that is service connected or non service connected disability. OK, so let's kind of briefly discuss what service connected disability is. So disability, like I mentioned again, is means that you're unable to perform the essential functions of your specific job due to injury or illness. Service connected disability means that your job has caused or substantially contributed to your illness or injury it means injured on the job. You must be permanently incapacitated. That's very, very important. That is what the law states that you must be permanently incapacitated. Temporary disabled is not applicable for a SCD or service connected disability. Now to apply for a service connected disability, there is no minimum service requirement, service credit requirement, so you do not have to be vested to apply and potentially be granted a service connected disability. The service connected disability pays 50% of final average compensation or your service retirement benefit amount, whichever is greater if you're eligible. Like I mentioned, this is just kind of a brief overview of service connected disability, and then I'm going to be covering non service connected disability on the next slide. But please, if you have questions related more to this, please contact our office and speak to one of the retirement specialists that can help you with those questions. So non service connected disability, same rules apply. You still have to be unable to perform the essential job functions due to injury or illness. You still must be considered permanently incapacitated. Temporary disabled is not applicable. Now, what's different with the non service connected disability is that you need to be vested with at least five years of service. The benefit also varies for a non service connected disability depending on your age and years of service and could be up to one third of your final average compensation or your service retirement benefit amount, whichever is greater. Um, what I, as I mentioned on the previous slide, if you have more questions about these disability process and how these benefits work, please contact our office and speak to, to a retirement specialist. They'll be happy to help you go over that in more detail. OK, so. The next thing here is death benefits before retirement. So with this slide here, we provide death benefits to your beneficiaries if something were to happen to you before you retire. And then also depending on the option that you select when you retire, there may be benefits that go to your beneficiary. But right here, these are just going to be some death benefits that we're going to cover um, 
before retirement that your beneficiaries could be eligible for if something were to happen to you. Now, here on this slide, these are considering that uh, benefits options here for your beneficiary, if something were to happen to you, if you were vested in the plan with five years of service or more. So you do have three benefit options here for a named beneficiary, an eligible spouse or a minor child can get these. So option one, you can choose any beneficiary. So it could be anyone, doesn't have to be a spouse or a minor child. It could return the return of employee contributions and interest plus up to six months of employee salary. Option two, to a qualified beneficiary only, as you can see there in the footnote at the bottom of the slide, is the spouse or a minor child. Monthly survivor's benefit allowance, so it will be a monthly lifetime benefit to that beneficiary. And then option three would be a reduced monthly survivor's allowance benefit, so it would be less than option two and up to six months of the employee's salary. So these are benefits that are available to your beneficiary if something were to ha happen to you as an active employee. Now, we do also have death benefits that are paid out as well if um, for members that are not vested with five years of service or who are deferred before they retire. So if you're an active member with less than five years of service, the your beneficiary would receive a return of your employee contributions that you made into the system plus interest and up to six months of employee salary. Deferred members terminated, uh, uh, you terminated employment. This is the return of employee contributions and interest. So basically we would refund all your contributions and interest there. Now we also do have other qualifications here for non-service connected death. Remember you must have at least five years of service to be a, a non-service connected death there. Um, a spouse or a minor child must be a beneficiary to receive a 60% continuance of a non-service connected death retirement or service retirement, whatever is greater. Now, if there is a service connected death, meaning a death on the on the job, you do not have to be vested with five years of service, very similar to a service connected and non service connected disability. The spouse or minor child must be the beneficiary to receive a 100% service connected death retirement or service retirement ben um, continuing benefit, whichever is greater. As I mentioned, these are just brief overviews of these different options. So if you have any questions, please contact our office. Okay. So give me a moment here, guys. I'm trying to just catch up on the chat here. We do have a lot of questions. We're trying to get through them as much as we can. Um, whatever we don't answer right now, we'll try and get through after the presentation. So just thank you guys for submitting your questions. Okay, so the, the last thing here about death benefits, naming your beneficiary. This is very, very important. This is something that everybody needs to just check on and make sure. So death benefits for your for Sarah benefit are payable to your designated beneficiary. So whoever, if something were to happen to you, whoever you have listed on that account, even if that's not who you wanted to have listed there, we have to pay that out to that person unless you elect someone different. Your beneficiary could be anyone. Death benefits are available if you are vested, non-vested, active, and deferred, like I mentioned on the two slides before. But you always want to just make sure that you keep your beneficiary up to date with us. If you update your beneficiary with your employer, they do not give us that information, so we can't update it on our end. You have to actually submit a beneficiary change form to our office directly to make that change. So you can check who your current beneficiary is through the member portal, or you can call us and we can tell you who you have as your beneficiary. Now, change of beneficiary form can be found on our website um, under forms, but I have also linked it there in the PowerPoint presentation. So you can actually click on that link. It will take you to the form. So if you need to change your, or update your beneficiary, fill that out, mail that form into us, drop it off at our Dropbox or send it to the county stop mail. We are stop 40 and we can make that change for you. Okay, so the next topic is divorce. It's another big one. So divorce, California is a community property state. An ex-spouse may be entitled to an interest in your retirement benefit. So throughout your career as a county employee, as, or as I should say, as a FACERA member, if you ever have a divorce, we need finalized divorce documents in order to process your retirement benefit and pay you out. Because if we don't have those documents, we have to hold off on paying you because we need to see if your ex-spouse has an interest in your benefit. So you need to make sure that if there is a divorce, notify Facera as soon as possible. 
or if you are in the divorce process, notify us. So we, we have it on the radar. We can put it in your account to look for that. Now, each divorce case is unique and must be reviewed by our divorce unit. We are only interested in marriages that occur during your Facera membership. So if you had a divorce prior to being hired, uh, becoming a member of Facera, that's okay. We don't care about that. It's only during your Facera membership. And then, as I mentioned a little bit before, outstanding divorce documents may delay your retirement benefit. So a good rule of thumb is while you're getting documents together to give to provide to our office, if you if you've already experienced a divorce and it's been finalized um, during your Facera membership, send us a copy so that way we can put that in your file and it can be reviewed by our divorce unit. So then later on, when you're ready to retire, everything will be everything will be um, excuse me, I'm sorry. Everything will then be placed in your file, so it'll be the process will be a little smoother when you're ready to retire. Okay, so a little bit more about divorce. Common divorce documents, judgment of dissolution or the attachment to judgment and or marital settlement agreement. We do need copies of those. That's important. So to, to see if there's a division of property. Now, if there is a division of retirement benefits and your ex-spouse is owed a percentage of your benefit, we will need a joinder or court file domestic relations order, DRO. Our divorce policy and sample documents are available on our website as I've linked it there in the PDF there. So you can look at those divorce policy and, and, and see how that all plays out. If you have any questions, please contact our divorce unit. They can go over that with you in more detail. Okay. All right. We're doing pretty good, guys. We're almost, we're a little over halfway through. And then I see still a lot of questions in the chat. So, you know, keep them coming. We're going to try and get them done as fast as we can here. You know, thank you all for being here again. Okay. So the next slide here is terminating employment. What are my options? Well, this is something we want to talk about because while in the midst of your career, there may be a possibility that you leave your employer for a new opportunity or vice versa. If you happen to leave your employer, there are some options of what you can do with your retire retirement contributions that you've already put into the system as an active employee. Okay, so the first thing here, Sorry, just going to get that going here. The first option of what you can do with your retirement contributions if you terminate your employment is refund of contributions. You may only take what you have contributed in the associated interest. You are not entitled to the employer's contribution. Funds can only be withdrawn at separation. So we do get a lot of questions asking, hey, can I borrow against my retirement for a mortgage or things like that? Unfortunately, not with this plan. You cannot borrow against your retirement at any time. The only time that you have access to those funds is if you were to which terminate your employment or you would or you retire. If you decide to refund your contributions, you forfeit any potential lifetime monthly benefit that may be entitled to you. So, for example, if you are vested with five years of service and then you and then you decide to leave and withdraw your money, you would you would forfeit any potential benefit that you could be paid if you were to wait until you hit your age requirement. Now, a couple refund options if you do choose to refund your contributions would be the first one would be direct distribution. That's a cash on you receive a check in the mail. If you go with this route, you're subject to a mandatory 20% federal tax withholding and optional state tax withholding as well. The second option there is you can choose to do a direct rollover, which is transferring funds to a qualified retirement account to avoid potential withdrawal penalties and taxes, such as a 401k, 403b, 457, and an IRA. Finally, partial direct distribution, partial rollover. Okay, so let's look at the next option there. So the next option, well, what you can do with your retirement contributions is what we call deferral. Basically, all this means is that you're leaving your contributions on deposit with us. 
If you decide to defer your retirement, you can still refund your contributions at any time and waive rights to a potential future payment. You just need to fill out the form to let us know what you're electing. And anytime someone does leave employment, we do mail a disposition of retirement contributions form so you can tell us what you want us to do with the contributions you've made into the plan. Now, if you leave and decide to defer your retirement, interest will continue to accrue on those contributions twice a year. We all accrue interest on our contributions twice a year on June, June 30th and December 31st. Now, benefits of deferring. So if you're vested with five years of service, if you decide to leave employment and defer, you could defer until retirement and receive a monthly lifetime benefit once you're eligible, meaning that you get that age requirement. If you're not vested, so you have less than five years of service, you can return to work for a facility plan sponsor later on and become vested or establish reciprocity with a California public agency, which is what I'm going to get into right now here. So reciprocity is the linking of two or more participating California public employers. This is designed to protect the value of your pension and also encourage a career in the public sector. Now, this may not apply to a lot of you today. The, um, it could. You may have came from a, former, uh, a prior California public agency, but this also could apply to you later in your career. So this is why it's, it's important to kind of discuss, have this discussion here. So reciprocal agencies that we can establish this link for with our pension plan here is any county in California, many cities and municipalities, including the city of Fresno, any CalPERS managed agency, any agency or local government that has an agreement with CalPERS, CalSTRS, and the judge's retirement system. Oops. Sorry, got ahead of myself there. Okay. So how would you go about establishing your reciprocity? Well, to, in order to establish this link, you must terminate and leave your contributions on deposit at the prior retirement association. So one, if like, for example, you, leave, you worked for CalPERS, which is, or the state of California, which is under the CalPERS system, and then you leave to come to the county of Fresno. In order to establish that link, because that's an eligible agency, you have to leave your employment there at the state and come and leave your money on deposit with them before coming to the county of Fresno. You must establish a new membership and a new association within six months of leaving the prior association. Once established, so if you do have reciprocity established between you, uh, one agency and Facera or more, you must retire from all systems on the same day. That's very important. Otherwise, you can't take advantage of some of the benefits of reciprocity, which I'm going to cover on the next slide here. Reciprocity is also optional, so you don't have to do it if you qualify for it. Um, but um, but it, there are some good benefits to do it if you can. If you have questions about reciprocity or maybe seeing if your prior agency can establish, please contact our office. And here, this slide here just kind of goes over what the advantages of establishing reciprocity is. So one of the advantages of establishing reciprocity is answering is uh, years of service, I should say. Years of service will be added together from all systems to determine vesting and retirement eligibility. The second advantage there is salary or final average compensation. Your benefit will be based on the highest final average compensation in any linked agency. Contribution rates. If you're in tiers one through four and you establish reciprocity, Facera potentially may use your members, will use the member's entry age from the reciprocal entry agency to, to determine contribution rates. Because in tiers one through four, your contributions are based off of your age at entry. So whatever age that you were when you were hired, you're paying contributions based on that age. So reciprocity could, could affect that as well. So here's kind of like a small example of how this reciprocity works, okay? So let's say that I am a state of California employee under the CalPERS system. Let's say I worked there two years and I leave to come join the County of Fresno. Let's say that I then stay at the County of Fresno for the rest of my career. Let's say, let's just use 30 years. It doesn't matter which number I use, but 30 years, okay? Let's say I establish this link of reciprocity.
So if you establish that link of reciprocity, Facera and the state will be talking to each other. And we'll be able to utilize the different utilize the information. So for example, that first bullet point there, years of service. So I worked two years of, of service at CalPERS. And then I worked 30 years at the county. CalPERS can use that 30 years of service that I worked at the county to make me vested in their CalPERS plan with only two years of service. So by just establishing that link, I become vested in the CalPERS plan, which I previously was not. And I will get my benefits paid off the two years that I worked there. Now, it takes it another step further here with salary or final average compensation. Your salary will, um, will be based on the highest final average compensation at any linked agency, like I mentioned. So let's just say at the state, I made 40000 Let's say then at the time that I leave and I go to the county, by the time I'm ready to retire, let's say my highest final average compensation was 80000 both Facera and CalPERS will use that $80,000 salary to calculate your retirement benefit. So when you're ready to retire and you retire from both agencies on the same day, by establishing that link, you're going to get a benefit from Facera and you're going to get a benefit from CalPERS. So CalPERS will pay you based off of the two years of service that you earned, and then they will use that $80,000 salary that you had at the county. And this can work either way. If the roles were reversed and you started at the county and went to the state and stuff like that, the same rules apply. So that, that's why there's a lot of good advantages of this reciprocity. Now, there are some disadvantages of reciprocity here. So breaking reciprocity can have a negative impact on your retirement. This can have a change in your age-based contribution rate. So meaning that if you're in one of those age-based tiers, if you were to get your age changed um, and then you broke reciprocity by leaving your employment or doing something else, it can impact your retirement and you would have to change your age back to the age that you actually were when you joined the other agency, which means that you may end up having to make up lost contributions that you were not paying. It's a big mess. Could also affect your ability to retire in each system. Also by breaking reciprocity, we both agencies can't share your highest final average compensation. Um, refund of contributions. You cannot refund your contributions from the previous agency until you have refunded your contributions from the most current agency. So basically what this means is we've had some, inst some examples of members that want to refund they are, they are uh, have reciprocity established between us and another agency. They want to refund their contributions from the other agency, and they don't want reciprocity anymore. But they can't do that unless they are unless they are no longer employed with us, and they refund their contributions from us, the most current agency. So that's another way of breaking breaking reciprocity, and then disability retirement. Your benefit may be adjusted based on your awarded disability benefit from the reciprocal agency. Okay, so we have probably just a few more slides. Um, I'm gonna be talking about our last topic here, financial planning and wellness really quickly here. And then we're gonna kind of get into more of your questions and in the chat, cause I know there's a lot of questions there. We're gonna try and get through all of them and then I'll be able to answer more on um, more here so let's just we're going to just power on through here and get through the last few slides here but thank you all again for tuning in so the last topic here that i kind of wanted to discuss here today that's another building block to help plan your retirement is your financial planning and wellness being prepared so what so while this is i just want to throw this out here these are just educational tools this is not me providing advice telling you what to invest in and things of that nature these are just educational tools that you can use to help to help um, plan for that retirement date of your choice. So financial wellness is the overall financial health of an individual individual. So why is this important? Well, it can help you plan for the future. It can help avoid help or avoid common issues for employees such as stress, health or diet, depression, anxiety, poor job performance because you can't concentrate because you're worried about your finances and life events like divorce, medical, et cetera. So having a good financial wellness is, is great for your future and planning for your retirement. So 
Here's a thought. So I did some research. According to Nielsen data, the American Payroll Association, Career Builder, and the National Endowment for Financial Education, roughly 50 to 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, we're very fortunate that, you know, we're still working here, you know, but the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted us all. But look at those numbers prior to the pandemic. 50 to 78% were living paycheck to paycheck. So that's that's a little, that's a red flag to me right there. Almost three in 10 Americans have no emergency fund that covers at least three months of expenses. And then also in a recent survey from Career Builder, more than 70% of respondents say that they are in debt. So that's also something that can help, that can impact your retirement and your choice when you want to retire. So income during retirement. So this is kind of something that you need to think about when you're planning your, your retirement from with Facera. You need to ask how much you need to ask yourself, how much income do I need? Well, based off of surveys and stuff from financial advisors and just statistics of cost of living and things of that nature, advisors suggest that you need 70 or to 80 percent of your pre-retirement income as retirement income. So that includes a bunch of different income sources. As you can see on the pyramid there, I have on the screen. So on the bottom is your Facera pension. That is that is the that is your um your stable legs of your retirement benefit there. But keep in mind that your Facera pension may not be enough to cover your financial needs when you retire because with the rising cost of cost of living, healthcare, things of that nature, your pension may not be enough. So you may need to have other sources of income to, to help offset uh, your retirement costs. So a couple other things that, um, that go along with that income our deferred compensation, our 457 plan with Nationwide, is your social security, and then savings and personal investments. All four of these there options there all combine to help make your retirement income. And you know, everybody's everybody's need or how much income that you need in retirement is going to be different. Everyone has their own different expenses and things in that nature. So it's a matter of sitting down and figuring out what what is your plan how much income do you think you need to, to do you need when you retire these are these are things that you can start thinking about now even if you're not going to retire for another 20 years because it's better to always start early and and get a plan going it, but it's also never too late to start so keep that in mind so being prepared have a plan budget debt management savings or emergency fund and then i'm going to talk about deferred comp plan 457 so these are just little tools and tips here to be prepared for retirement and planning your financial wellness. So why have a plan? Let's go over this first. What are your goals? You got to ask yourself, what, what are your goals? If you're married, ask your spouse, what are your goals in, uh, for later in your career when you retire? Do you, or just your goals in life, for example. Do you want to retire early? Okay. What age do you want to retire at? How much income do you need to live off of to retire early? What are your expenses? Things of that nature. Do you want to save money for college for your kids? Are you buying a new home or another big purchase? Other things to have to, in consideration with your plan? How much will you need? How much can you save? And then how are you going to track your performance? These are all things to consider when you're planning for your retirement, um, especially in a time now where everything is everything is going, you know, it's a little crazy with the COVID-19 pandemic and everything. It's always good to just kind of sit down and have a plan for the future, figuring out what your goals are, what you want to achieve. And this doesn't necessarily have to always pertain to retirement too. That's why I listed other things on there as far as college for, for kids, buying a house, buying a new car, things like that. Oh, you can always have a plan to kind of figure out how to attack this and achieve that goal. Now, the other tip here is the dreaded B word. Budget. Nobody likes to hear this word, right? Budget. Oh, I, I probably said that word and I hear people just, oh gosh, shivering. They hate this word. But a budget can really help with your financial planning and as far as also help planning your retirement. So the budget is a summary of estimated income and how you will spend it over a period of time. This is, allows you to see where your money is going every month and track your spending. Now, really think about this for a minute. Every paycheck per month, 
do you know exactly where every single dollar is going? Think about that for a minute. Do you know where every single dollar is going? A lot of people don't. It is actually a shocker when you actually sit down and do a budget and to find out where your money is going. You might realize that you have a lot of money going out to something you didn't realize. So by having like a little bit of a budget, or just seeing what your expenses are, it can kind of really help plan for the future, for your retirement. Things that like if you wanted to retire early, for example. So having a budget can also help you save money for retirement because saving is part of that income. Let me go back to that pyramid here. Saving is part of that pyramid right there, along with your Facera pension, which is the, the base of your income for retirement. Saving and personal investments are a big part of that as well. So having a budget can help you figure out what you can save prior to retiring. Um, we live in the digital age now, so there's various, everybody seems to have a smartphone now. So there's various online tools or apps that you can use to start a budget, at least track your expenses. So like the every dollar app, the mint app, people even use Excel sheets or Google docs to kind of do their own budget just to see where they stand. I personally do one. Um, and I was personally surprised when I started sitting down and doing it, where my money was going. So to make some adjustments to help save and plan for the future and my retirement. So I definitely recommend doing that if if you want to just kind of get an overall financial picture of your of your um, of your standing. The other thing is the other topic here is debt management. So why are we talking about debt management when we're talking about retirement? Well, to me, it goes hand in hand. Um, you saw in the previous a couple of slides ago that I said that, you know, a lot of members and I let me look at the. In a recent survey, more than 70 percent of respondents say that they are in debt. OK. So ask yourself what it would be like if you had no payments. So let's say you had a car payment, credit cards, student loans, things like that. What would it be like if you didn't have to make those payments? How much extra income would you have for either saving or for just personal use? This can really help boost your retirement, especially if you are retiring and you still have a lot of, and you still have debt payments to make. That could impact your cost of living. So that's also something to consider out when you're looking at your Facera benefit and things of that nature. So you should manage your debt or debt reduction. You should review your credit report yearly, at least twice a year, to see if there's any fraudulent activity or just kind of see where, where you stand. Now, real quick, there are two. There are two methods that a lot of members and a lot of people use to help pay off their debt. The first one is debt avalanche, which is pay off debt in the highest, in the order of highest to lowest interest, and you pay the minimum amount on other debts while attacking the highest debt with a vengeance. The other one there is debt snowball. This is probably the one that's most commonly used amongst people when they're trying to get themselves out of debt and get on the right side of their finances. This is to pay off debt in order of smallest to largest, you make your minimum payments on all your debts except the smallest, and then you pay as much as you can on the on that debt. And then after that debt has been paid off, you roll all that money that you were pouring into that one into the next one and so forth. Like a snowball, you're building to knock all that stuff out. Now, just a little quick little story. This is this is hard. I will I will say that personally because I've done this. I did the debt snowball. I paid off my student loans after I graduated from college because using that method. It was tough, but I knew that for my future, I had to do it. Now, the, like I said, these are not, these are only just educational tips. They're not saying, hey, you should do this, but it's it's a way to kind of look and make you think about your whole picture because your Facera benefit is only one part of your whole retirement picture. While it's a big part, it's a huge, huge part of that. You also have to look at these deciding factors because this kind of goes back to when we get questions as far as when is the best time to retire? Well, you have to look at your whole financial picture. You have to let only look at what you're getting from Facera. You need to look at, okay, are you getting Social Security? Do you have deferred comp? What are your expenses going to look like? Can you make that work? Things like that. Health insurance, that's a big one too. And um, health insurance, I'm just going to get this out of the way right now because I know that's probably a question that's going to come up is, what are my health insurance options? Well, to be perfectly honest with you all, for Sarah, we do not handle anything health insurance related. Your health insurance is entirely on you. When you're ready to retire, you can contact county employee benefits 
and they have a couple of health health insurance plans for retirees, or you can seek out another insurance plan. But unfortunately for Sarah, we do not deal with anything with uh, with health insurance. If you you know end up wanting to retire in the near future and you want to contact employee benefits, you can contact them at 61810. But like I was getting back to that, th this is a huge thing because you need to re you need to look at your whole picture to see because that can really help you answer your question as far as when the best time is to retire. Now, um, emergency fund and savings. Basically, this is just money set aside to cover life's unexpected events. This can help reduce financial stress, can help stop adding to the debt. Uh, experts do say your emergency fund should be three to six months of expenses. That's really up to you um, if you want to do that. It is definitely recommended. It's always good to have a rainy day fund just in case like, hey, a car breaks down or, or you need to go to the doctor, things like that. So that's also something good to consider. Now, like I mentioned, um, we live in the digital age now. There are so many tools to your disposal and the financial wellness you know, planning movement has been really taking off the last few years. Um, so these are just some tools that you can look at if you want more information on how you can look at and try to get your finances in order for retirement. Internet. Everybody uses the internet, right? Internet is your biggest source because there's so many things out there to look at. YouTube is perfect. YouTube honestly is one of the best tools because there are so many people that that have videos of their financial journey or just like tips about things like that to help you plan for retirement. And everybody, there's so many different content creators that do this. You can find one that fits that you like and kind of that you can listen to and you want to, you know, start planning around. Google, obviously. There's podcasts. Uh, there's a bunch of different financial planners and wellness uh, podcasts out there. Like, for example, Dave Ramsey is probably one of the biggest ones, but that's, you know, every he's not everybody's cup of tea, but that he's one of the biggest ones out there. There's a lot of books that you can take advantage of that you can read about this stuff, or you can hire a financial planner. I know that personally, when I used to be a retirement specialist, um, I did, when I met with members, they did have, um, uh, there were a lot of them that did have financial planners that have been helping them throughout their, their career with this process, getting things in line. So that might also be something, something to consider as well if you are not the best with numbers or wanting to get all this information. Now, to kind of wrap this up here about financial planners, let's not forget deferred comp. So as I mentioned on that pyramid, your Facera benefit is one of your biggest tools there or biggest income earners for your retirement. You should take advantage of deferred compensation as well if you have not already. This can help supplement income when you retire. So this is actually very important for members that are in tiers four and five. I can't hammer this and say this enough times. If you are in tiers four and five, take advantage of deferred comp. It is so important because right there, look at that bullet point. Tiers four and five do not have a COLA. So we do not have a cost. I'm, I'm a tier five member. I do not have a cost of living adjustment. So I make sure that I, I enroll into deferred comp to help supplement my income, to help offset that when I'm ready to retire. You can start enrolling now and invest in your future. So for County of Fresno employees, our, our deferred comp plan is nationwide. You can click on that link right there, fresno457.com. Our rep is Deanna Sisk. She's awesome. I talk with her all the time. She's great. She will sit down and talk with you over the phone. Or I don't know if she's doing video conferencing, but she'll always talk with you over the phone and walk you through the different options and get you started on the deferred comp plan. Or if you're enrolling in the deferred comp plan and you want to see how everything's going in your plan, Send her an email. Give her a call. Look at your. She she can look up your information and kind of give you ideas of where you should be going from there. But absolutely, even if you're not in tiers four and five, if you're in tiers one through three, take advantage of deferred comp if you can. It it doesn't hurt to save a little more to have extra income when you retire. People, you know, everybody likes more money. So, you know, if you have not enrolled yet or just are interested, check out that four five seven website fresno four five seven dot com to look at all the different deferred comp information there. And then I have it listed there for the other other plan sponsors that we have, like Superior Courts, they have Empower Retirement, and the special districts, you would contact your HR department. Okay. So we are actually just about done here.
Um, and then we can get to answering some questions here. So thank you all for just sticking around here and then we're gonna get through some of your questions. So here is Facera contacts for you. So like I mentioned, if you need access to the member portal, you can email us with your work address at facera at fresnocountyca.gov. Or if you have any other questions, just send us an email there. Our mailing address is 7772 North Palm Avenue. Uh, we are, our main cross streets are on Palm and Knees. If you're familiar where GB3 is and uh, Wahoo's Fish Tacos, that area out there, we're right across the street from there. That's where our office is located. Currently though, our office is temporarily closed to the public due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we do have members in the office or we do have employees in the office, so please give us a call. You can call us at 457-0681 for any questions. Um, a retirement specialist will assist you. Our website at FresnoCountyRetirement.org has a huge amount of information. And we try to update that, update that website all the time. And we're gonna be doing more of that in the future. So just always look on our website for more up-to-date information. So with that, I want to say plan and prepare for a happy retirement. You know, and for some of you, retirement may not be here for a while. Others, it may be here sooner than you think, but it's always good to get started now. That's why I'm so happy to see that a lot of you took the initiative to take this webinar today to at least learn a little bit about your retirement and get, get going in the right direction. Now, um, we are going to be doing more educational content in 2021. That's going to be even more webinars or just even short videos that we're going to be posting and stuff. I'm going to be the spearhead on that. So be on the lookout for those. Now we are going to just, uh, I see that we have a ton of information or questions here in the chat. So let me pull that up. We have a lot of questions here that we're going to get through. So let's try and uh, we're going to answer as many questions as we can get through here. We still have plenty of time left in the webinar. So um, if you have any more questions, add it to that Q&A here. Um, I'm going to see if I can have Donna here on mute here. And then um, we'll both be answering questions to, to kind of um, assist you all here. So all right, Donna, are you there? Yes, I am. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> OK, great. So. I think we should probably get started with. Let's see, I see that you published a lot of the questions, right? OK, good. So let's get started with the. Most recent ones that we have not gotten through yet, so let's see here. Let's see. Good job. You've got a lot through here, so bear <laughs> with us, everybody. We're, we're going through all the questions here. We're going to read them out loud, too, so you can hear that for for people that are going to watch this recording after the fact. Uh, let's see. Oh, man. So, Jared, we can go ahead and get started with the one that says, when looking at our timesheet, what, what exactly is not taken out in terms of contributions when we retire? How can we see how much we can make? Oh, I'm sorry. How can we see how much we will be making based on our current pay? So to answer that, when you retire, the only thing that's really being taken out of your retirement check is taxes. So keep so it's just taxes, unless if you want to sign up for REFCO, which is the retire uh, for uh, Fresno County Employees Association. If you sign up to be a part of their um, association, it's a dollar membership fee per month. And if you decide to also sign up for health insurance through, for example, Fresno County, you can have the health premium deducted out of your monthly check. But if you decide you don't want either one, the only thing really is just being taken out of your monthly retirement ch uh, check is taxes because your pension is taxable to you at the time that you retire. And to calculate how much uh, you um, could be receiving based on your current pay, I highly recommend using um, the member portal. And when you go into the member portal, you can just um, select what date you want to retire with and automatically um, the member portal will pick up your highest one year average pay. Just keep in mind, uh, we cannot project how much your future pay will be. However, in the member portal, there is a box there for you to um, enter a 
you know, uh, an estimate of what your future pay um, will be. And you can definitely enter that amount there and uh, run the calculation to give you an idea. OK, good. All right, so then I, I guess we'll kind of just like tag team this. I'll go to the next yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so the next question here in the chat is, uh, what is the email address that I send to email to get my identifier to get in the portal? The email that you're going to send is facera at fresnocountyca.gov. It's actually going to be on that second to last slide in your in the presentation. I have it up here on the screen. So you can just send an email there and then we can get you uh, that portal access there. Let's see. Okay, so the next one is earlier in the webinar, age at the time of retirement was discussed as a factor in determining benefit. But what is the significance of age at the time of entry into the system? Well, that depends on the that depends on the tier that you're in. So um, if you are in an age-based system, so that's tiers one through four, and correct me if I'm wrong, Donna, like the the younger that you are, your contribution rate's a little um Man, I'm it's a little less. It's a little less, yes. I don't know why I can't think of my words today. It's a little <laughs> less compared to if you were coming into as an older employee. So someone that's paying, it's someone that comes in at age 25 compared to someone coming in at age 40 is going to pay a little less of a contribution rate. But those are for only contribution or age-based contribution tiers. So that's tiers one through four. So there we go with that. Okay. And then the next question is, is the monthly benefit pre-tax? It is not our take home pay, correct? Does the monthly benefit include Social Security? Um, so again, like how I mentioned earlier, so your monthly benefit check is, I'm sorry, your uh, retirement, when you retire, um, your benefit is taxable to you and we withhold taxes at your direction. So when you're running the calculation on the member portal, the amount that you're seeing there is gross pay and it does not include um, the, it does not, it's not your net pay. So it doesn't take into account um, the taxes and um, your monthly benefit does not include Social Security. So Social Security, it's its own separate entity. If you're applying to uh, draw Social Security, um, I recommend that you contact the Social Security office to find out how much you're getting monthly. And again, it's two separate entity. It'll be two separate check. Okay. Okay, let's see here. Is the survivor allowance the same amount as my re retirement monthly allowance or is it less? Well, that depends. So survivor allowance, well, I mean, I don't know if we classify that as two different. So survivor and continuous, would you consider that the same, Donna, or are we going to talk about like considered active deceased compared to like a continuing benefit for a retiree's beneficiary? Um, so there's like two things. So like survivor allowances, it could uh, apply to active deceased members. So meaning that if um, you're a, an active employee and you pass away and you um, have enough year service to, uh, well, depending on uh, what type of um, death it is, uh, it will also determine what type of um, benefit will be. So if you, for, I'll just going to go ahead and touch up on if you were to retire and after you retire and you pass away, how much um, will your beneficiary receive? So it just really depends on the option that you're going to select at the time of retirement. So once again, we do have um, different type of options like Jerry went over earlier in the um, PowerPoint. So for example, one of them is um, the modify option. If you um, retire with the modify option, that option will leave a 60% continuing benefit to your beneficiary at the time that you pass, provided that the beneficiary is um, a spouse who is eligible to receive a continuing benefit and or if there's no eligible spouse, um, we will look to see if there's a, a minor child at the time of your death. And um, if there is one, then they can receive a 60% continuum benefit until age um, 20. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jared, or 22. 22. A 22 provided that they stay in school full time. Yes, 22. Um, and they're not married. Yes. All right. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, so the next one here, and thank you all for sending these questions and there's a lot of good <laughs> questions here. Um, does the child have to be minor to be a beneficiary? What about adult children? I am divorced. The child does not have to be minor. It could be anyone. It could be an adult child, but depending on the option that you select when you are, when you retire, that could impact what your beneficiary is receiving. So for one of the options, and I, you know, now I think about it, guys, I'm apologize. I think I skipped a slide today. Unless I just <sighs> completely missed it. I am so sorry, everyone. So I think I missed slide 18. Yes. Retirement yes. benefits. I missed this <laughs> slide. I apologize, guys. We'll cover this really quickly here because that in incorporates your question here. So these here is just a summary of the different retirement options that you have as a um when you come in for retirement. So we have the unmodified option, option one, two, three, and four. As you can see on the screen there, those are the different um, characteristics of each option. Now, if you want to list an adult child as your beneficiary, that is, you can absolutely do that. Now, depending on the option that you select, your, bene your beneficiary will be entitled to some a different type of benefit, whether that could be a potential continuing lifetime benefit where they will get a payment every month for the rest of their lifetime, or they would get a payout of any remaining contributions or an interest in, in the plan if there is any at the time of the member's death. So that's a good slide, and I apologize for missing that earlier. Um, that's a good slide there to kind of look over and see the differences in each option. Um, I recommend that if you have questions about this option, just call our office, speak to a specialist. We can uh definitely assist with that and kind of give you more details and different scenarios on how that would work for you let's see all right so the next one is how can i change my contribution amounts <laughs> um unfortunately you cannot change your contribution amounts those are already set for you those contribution amounts are are based off of the contribution rates that are set each fiscal year. So you cannot put more or less into the contributions. The contributions are already decided for you. Let's see. Man, whew, a lot of good questions here. Mm -hmm. um, a beneficiary will, will benefit the most only if they are a spouse or a minor child. An adult child beneficiary will receive what I put in an interest as a one-time payment. That is true and not exactly all true in a sense. So let me explain that. So I still have that benefit option page right there open on the screen. So yes, most of the time an adult child was, is only going to receive a refund of con excess contributions and interest if there is any left in the account. But when you retire, if you want to list your adult child, for example, as a beneficiary, you could take options two or three right there on the screen. Options two or three provide a lifetime continuing benefit to any beneficiary of your choice. but if you were to go that route, depending on the age difference between you and that beneficiary, your benefit amount will be reduced. Um, and it, the, the more it's reduced is, is dependent on the age difference between you and that beneficiary that you elect. And like I mentioned, and it says on that slide right there, the beneficiary can be anyone, but it will, it will reduce your benefit the bigger the age difference. Option two is a 100% continuance. Um, the continuance can be less than 100% if it's a non members or non spouse or option three provides a 50% lifetime continuance at a reduced benefit as well. If a member decides to select one of those options, they cannot change their beneficiary at any time. It is set in stone. You cannot change that. So that's a very good question there. Okay. So the next one here is, so if I change jobs to the private sector, is it most beneficial to leave the retirement benefits with Facera? Well, um, that's a depends question. That is a question that we really, it, it really depends on your, on your situation. So if you were vested in the plan with five years of service and decide to take a job in the private sector, you have the option to leave it in there and, and uh, retire later on when you hit the eligible age, or you can wait later on and then just get a lifetime benefit from us, even if it's a small amount. It's a benefit that you'll get every month for the rest of your life. Now, we we do have members that do both. 
We have some that go to the private sector that leave their benefit there and they retire at a later age. And then we do have some that take out their benefit and then they invest it into their own investments. So that's that's really something that we can't answer. You have to kind of weigh the pros and cons. So that's another good utilization of the portal right there. The portal can actually, you can manipulate the portal to say, hey, if I'm leaving my job position on this date, what is my benefit going to look like at this at, at age this date or age 55, 60, things like that. So you can kind of see if it's worth doing that in your own situation. But everybody's situation is going to be different. So um, there's not a one size fits all answer to that. OK, um, so the next one is do you mail or email the change of beneficiary form to Facera? So we do ask that you mail the original form to our office with your web signature on there and um, the beneficiary form. Please note that um, we do require a witness signature other than your named beneficiary to sign the form as well. So it can and in other words, um, it cannot be um, your beneficiary that you're listing to sign the form. It has to be someone other um, to witness the form. And the next question is, is there a time limit to work on reciprocity? How far back can you? So again, with reciprocity, like Jared mentioned earlier, um, you have to when you um, leave the let's just say when you leave the reciprocal agency and you come to work for Fresno County, uh, you have to leave your uh, contributions on deposit and establish membership with the um, with another um, reciprocal agency within six months. So if you meet that requirements, but you have never request uh, for reciprocity to be established, you actually have up until um, your date of retirement to request for it. Because um, again, with reciprocity, you have to retire on the same date to not uh, to benefit to receive all the benefits um, for reciprocity. OK. Uh, next question here is if I was hired as extra help at age 21 and became permanent at age 22, I bought my time back as an extra help employee. Will my age be 21 or 22? So right here, um, it's 22. yes, it's 22 <laughs> because um, at age 21, um, it was just extra help time. So you didn't become a permanent employee until you were 22. So um, that extra time, that extra help time, you can purchase it to help increase your year of service. But really, you didn't become a full time permanent employee until age 22. OK, perfect. Um, why do people retire in March or any particular month? I heard that March is more beneficial. Why is this correct? Thank you. Well, OK, so there that is a fully loaded question. Um, <laughs> people retire tend to retire in the first quarter, especially in March, if they follow if they are in an eligible tier for a cost of living adjustment. So if they happen to fall in that tiers one through three, a lot of them tend to retire to get that percentage of that cost of living adjustment for that current year. Because to be eligible for that cost of living adjustment each year in those eligible tiers, you have to be retired or, or retire on or before April 1st of that current year. So that's probably why you see an influx of a lot of people wanting to retire that time. Now, that's only in certain instances. There are people that retire in certain months, in particular months, because it may be a work anniversary or their birthday. Because remember I mentioned age is also a factor of your, um, age is also a factor in your benefit. So for example, if if you were looking to retire in May, but your benefit but your birthday is in June, people may want to that person may want to wait until June because their benefit will be bigger because they hit that next age, that next age for their retirement benefit. So there, there are a bunch of different factors to consider as far as what's best for you to retire. Somebody else can't tell you what is the best for you to retire. That's something that you will have to make that decision on. But that's another good reason to utilize the member portal to kind of look at your numbers. And especially if you fall in that eligible tier for that cost of living, once you find out what that cost of living adjustment is that the board approves, you can kind of do the math and see how much of an increase it would be if you were to retire before April 1st. And if, or, and if it's worth doing that or waiting until you hit uh, your next birthday or something like that. OK, so let's see. Did I miss? <laughs> OK, do you have to establish reciprocity with Facera or vice versa at the time of the job change? No, Jared, 
Yes. So before um, you go into answering that question, do you mind going to that slide uh, in regards to reciprocity? Yes, absolutely. I think it just makes it easier. OK, there you this go. one right here, the how to establish. Yeah. OK, so do you have to establish reciprocity with Facera or vice versa at the time of your job change? You don't. Reciprocity is optional. You can notify us all the way up until your retirement date. But it's probably, I mean, in my personal opinion, it's probably better to do it sooner rather than later because it, depending on what plan that you are in from the prior employer, if you're in an age-based tier going into another age-based tier, it can affect your contributions that you're paying. I mean, is that, that that's correct, right, Donna? Like, depending yeah. on which... You know, you because if you if you if you're in an age based tier, and then you don't tell the agency that you want to establish till later on, there's a possibility that you could be, you know, there's a there's a whole realm of possibilities of something can happen, right? Um, yeah. So for example, like let's just say you're in tier one, you in the first agency you came out the age of 22, and then you left to go work for another agency. You want to establish reciprocity. Um, when reciprocity is established, then the um, agency will be the other. The agency that you left to go work for, they will be using your age at 22, rather than the age that you're entering into their system. So if you if you don't request for reciprocity until later. Because uh, really, you do have up until um, your retirement date to request for reciprocity. But um, when you, if you start at age 22 with the other one, and then you go to the new one, and you don't request it until later, uh, and they, um, what they're going to do is, uh, depending on the tier, they, um, well, it also depends on the tier too. <laughs> so if you don't let them know, you may be going to a different tier. And also at an older age. So what does that mean? You're going to probably be paying more. Um, you could probably be paying less or more retirement contributions. But if you're to re if you're to request for a reciprocity right away, then um, at the new agency, they will be using if reciprocity can be established, they will be using your age from the reciprocal agency, which is 22. And then uh, that's going to be the um, contribute the age rate that they're going to be using to uh, deduct your contributions at. Am I missing anything, Jared? No, I think you, okay. I think you hit it right on the, on the, on the head right there. That's, I think that's good. Um, so thank you for the question. Let's see. Uh, how does leave for pregnancy impact retirement service credit? Well, that depends. When you take that pregnancy leave or that maternity leave, are you still receiving a paycheck? If you're still getting paid and you're making contributions to, to retirement, your, your service credit is not impacted. The only time your service credit is impacted is if you take a leave of absence and you're not contributing into retirement. When we do not receive those retirement contributions, you are not earning service credit. So it just depends if, if that leave of absence, if you are still using like annual leave or you're, you know, you're getting paid throughout that process and making contributions, then your service credit is not impacted. Regarding reciprocity, if one leaves CalPERS and works for county and establishes the reciprocity, then leaves the county and goes back to CalPERS, <laughs> does that individual need to establish reciprocity with CalPERS again? You could. You could. Um, but then again, you have to meet the requirement. So uh, you have to um, provide that you leave your contributions on deposit. You have to establish member. I'm sorry, establish membership with CalPERS within six months from your termination date from um, the last agency. So um, you could, like Jerry says, optional. Yes. Um, let's see here. Does Social Security affect my retirement benefit? Does Social Security benefit affect my retirement benefit? No. I'm assuming you're talking about drawing your social security benefit. Um, that's kind of it's kind of hard when you do these kind of questions like that when you're writing down instead of being in a room with people. <laughs> but that, that's what I'm assuming you're meaning. Um, so let's see. Uh, we'll go to the next one here from Joyce. If you name your minor as your beneficiary with 100% continuing benefit, till how old can the minor get the benefit? Is it a lifetime? So if you name your minor as your beneficiary with a 100% continuing benefit, meaning that you select that option two, 
that beneficiary gets it for the rest of their life, but it comes at the cost of your reduced benefit. Yes. So you can name the minor child as your beneficiary and select that option too. And then that beneficiary will get whatever you're getting for the rest of their lifetime in the case of your death. But keep in mind, the bigger the age difference between you and that beneficiary, the more reduced your benefit per month will be. And if you decide that you want to do that when you retire, if the beneficiary is a non-spouse and the age difference is more than 10 years apart, we do send that calculation out to our actuary to do that calculation for us. And that can uh, doing that can also potentially impact when you receive your retirement benefits. So kind of keep that in mind as well. Let's see. Thank you. It was very, very helpful. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. This was a, you know, we're hoping to do more of these type of webinars and everything. So I hope everybody found these useful. Are we taxed? Yes, we are taxed. So when you retire and you come and you come fill out the paperwork and meet with the retirement specialist, well, assuming pre, assuming the COVID pandemic is over, <laughs> um, you you will be provided tax forms. Um, you will fill out these tax forms to your discretion, and then you will have federal and state taxes withheld if you choose to. That is your decision. Um, we can't tell you what to do and how to fill out those tax forms, but yes, taxes are taken out for your benefit. And then that kind of answers answers the next question. Do we pay tax on our compensation? Uh, let's see. Okay, that looks like it was the same question. Yeah. yeah. Great information. I love the debt snowball budget planning. Thank you, Alyssa. I appreciate that. I, I think it's definitely, that's one thing that needs to be kind of discussed, not even necessarily in huge detail, but it's something that people need to consider when they're planning their retirement because you need to look at all aspects, not just your Facera benefit, which is a huge part of it by means. No, I'm not discrediting that. It is a huge part of it. That is your building block to your retirement, but you also have other factors that you need to look at that can determine when you can retire that is beneficial for so that it is beneficial to you what taxes are taken out what is it called on our timesheet um taxes are so for I, I okay so this is kind of like the issue with the these type of questions here is in, in the chat <laughs> is like uh, are you referring to as an active employee or a retiree so if you're referring to as a retiree the only taxes that are taken out the only two things that are taken out are federal and state taxes. Now, what is it called in your timesheet as far as, I, I don't know. Yeah, that I think um, the timesheet might, if you're talking as of like on your pay stub, you should see it, um, your taxes, um, it should say right there um, for like, I, think, I believe the after tax deduction on your pay stub. So if you have questions regarding like what is being taken out of, from your check every two weeks. I definitely um, just recommend looking at it. And if you are curious to see um, how much taxes is being taken out on your um, paycheck, I would definitely recommend contacting employee benefits for that information. Um, that's, yeah. So again, like Jared said, not sure if it's um, regarding towards when you retire uh, and you're receiving your monthly benefit or um, your bi-weekly check um how much is the health pr premium is it cheaper via county um as i mentioned earlier in the presentation we don't deal with anything health insurance related um that is something that you need to do prior to retirement getting all that stuff situated the county does offer retiree health insurance you can contact them directly at 600 1810 or you can even look on the employee benefits uh, website there and it actually has the listings for what the 2021 rates are so you can kind of see what those are but i recommend looking at all aspects for for health insurance because that is the, that is probably one of the biggest uh one of the biggest things that people look at before they can choose if they want to retire or not is if what their insurance is going to cost all righty let's see Ooh, we are just I know. Here. okay <laughs> We are we are going to try and get through as many of these questions here. We still got some time. Um, I know that I I can answer more questions if Donna needs to leave too. So don't worry, guys. I'm here for you. Um, it's okay. I, I I can be. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Okay. So what happens to your accrued vacation time upon retirement? Is it paid out in total? 
That depends on the annual leave plan that you're in. So most of the time, your annual leave hours are paid out to you on your last check. If you have hours in the time off bank, those hours have no cash value. So those hours are then can be transferred and used to, as service credit for retirement purposes. But we don't make any jurisdictions about your annual leave hours after you retire. We get these. We get a report from HR about your annual leave hours, and if there's anything that is applied to your retirement, we do it as an adjustment to your benefit, which you will see adjusted on your third benefit check. Otherwise, most of the time, your vacation time is just cashed out to you on your last check. So that's some, also something that you want to consider when you're getting closer to retirement, seeing how many hours that you have on the books, seeing if you want to really cash out all those hours at once, or if you have deferred comp, you can roll those hours into deferred comp. But that's something that you do directly with employee benefits, so you would speak with them. Uh, let's see. Thank you, Jared. The webinar was informative. I will have to view it again in six months to refresh. Mm -hmm. Have a safe and happy ho holiday. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, yes, this, this presentation will be uh, uploaded later for viewing, but I do plan on doing these at least twice a year, maybe once a quarter, just to kind of keep people informed and stuff. And there's going to be more things coming in the future. So just kind of look out for that. Uh, why have tears? Well, do you want the short answer or the long answer? It's <laughs> St it's statute, it's law. Basically, that's what it is. That's what we, it's what's established. It's what we got to go through. So just keep in mind that we are governed by the CERL, which is the County Employees Retirement Law of 1937 Act, and also PEPRA, which is the California Public Employees Pension Reform Act of uh, 2013. <laughs> So yes, we, we don't have no say in why there's so many tiers. <laughs> yes. Where on the timesheet is our tier information? I don't even think it says on your timesheet, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, um, I think, well, I know like for like tier five members, if you look on, well, as if I look at my check stub under the before tax deduction on your, on your um, check stub, it should um, tell you um, like for tier five, say general tier five, 50 slash 50, and that's your, um, um, deduction towards uh, retirement uh, for I know like tier one um, I'm not sure but I want to say there's like two contributions deduction and I think one of them is um, I believe one of them is uh, retirement miscellaneous and then the yes. other one is retirement um, miscellaneous supplemental yes you are correct mm -hmm. So it also it also does say on your actual instead of looking at your timesheet it does say on your pay stub so you can look at that or you could just you can give us a call or send us an email we can tell you too as well. Uh, so once you retire you can still get health insurance through the county of Fresno same price or higher price. Uh, you got to look on employee benefits website or contact them directly to find that answer. Um, I don't know the exact rates off the top of my head but you could still get insurance through the county but it's you would coordinate straight through them it would be nothing. We do nothing on the health insurance part. We have no nothing to do with that. Uh, can you touch upon the pros and cons? Oh boy. Um, of the temporary annuity. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> can you touch upon the pros and cons of the temporary annuity option of the Tau? Is it more <laughs> beneficial if you want to retire at age 50, 55 versus 50, 55 plus? Okay. So this isn't in the presentation because it is, I may consider adding this later on, but the temporary annuity option is an option that you can take if you are, you know, between the ages of 50 and 62. It's an advancement on your social security. So what that means is if you want to take this option, you would have to provide to us an estimate of your social security benefit at age 62. Whatever that option is, we plug that into our system and the system calculates what the advancement amount that you will get from us. And you will get that on top of the option that you select every month until you turn 62. Sounds great, right? Well, at age 62 is when we reduce your benefit. We don't reduce your benefit by the amount that's been loaned, uh, been apportioned out to you, that's been loaned out to you from the time being all the way up until 62. We reduce your benefit by the entire social security estimate that you provided at the time that you retire or that you submitted it to us. 
The thought process is that when that reduction happens on our end, you draw Social Security, and hopefully your benefit estimate that you got years back when you retired from Vicera holds up, and then you won't be missing any income. But because that's an estimate, and let's say you're drawing that at 50, and if you're not planning on working or contributing in Social Security anymore, there's a possibility that that estimate may be actually lower when you're ready to draw. So it can impact your retirement even more as far as like you're missing out on more money. Now, it's not something that we can say whether it's good or bad. Um, the way I look at it is when you're looking at the, the temporary annuity option when you're ready to retire and you're looking at the benefit amounts, you first need to consider your actual benefit from a facera the option that you want to select and the actual benefit from Facera itself before considering the towel in consideration. If that amount there that you have from there, plus any other investments or savings or anything else that you have, if you can make that work with your daily expenses and everything, there really is no reason to take the towel. There really is no reason because you're going to lose out on more. You're going to lose out on more long-term taking the towel than you would waiting. Now, everybody's situation is different. Um, we're not saying that you shouldn't take the towel or you should, um, but we do have people that take it um, at all different ages. Uh, it would make sense to take it at 50 because you're, you would get more years to it. But, you know, that's, that's really all based off a personal, personal situation. Like I mentioned, it's not something that we, we advocate for, but if you – feel that you need to take it that's that's your decision but that the best way i can look at it is you will get your benefit payment if you can make that work with plus with all your other income trees there is no reason to take the towel in, in my personal opinion there is no reason to um so but it is a very detailed subject and maybe that's something that i'm going to do a a educational thing piece on and put a content out there for you guys later on so you guys can see the pros and cons of doing that but that's a very good question. Uh, many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Can you change? Can change be make in the wait, what? Can change <laughs> be make in the middle of receiving retirement? I'm assuming change of beneficiary. I'm assuming that's what that means. Or because then I see well. Uh, can you change? I, I don't know how to answer that personally. Um. So let me see. Can we make, I'm sorry, can change be make in the middle of receiving retirement? So let's just say if uh, if I'm um, reading this correctly, if you already elect an uh, option at the time of retirement, uh, once you receive your first retirement check, you can no longer make any changes to your retirement. So if you go with the unmodified option and later on you say, oh, you know what, I want to change it to option two, you cannot do that. So you, again, uh, once you receive your first retirement check, you are not allowed to change your uh, retirement option. As for beneficiary, it really just depends. So um, going back to slide 18, if um, you select option um, two and three, you cannot change your beneficiary after retirement. Uh, option, the modified option and option one, it just really depends if you don't have a spouse, you can still update your beneficiary, but if you do have a spouse, again, um, a spouse trumps all other beneficiary, unless if you go with another option and you don't want to name your spouse, the spouse will have to sign a waiver saying that they're not interested in your retirement benefit. Perfect. Um, okay, there are so many titles. Is it SDI, FCICA? I'm assuming you're talking about your deductions um or pay stub i think <laughs> are we talking about retirement contributions um uh, if, we're if we're talking about looking at what your retirement contributions are it should say something like general tier or safety tier but if you're talking about your tax withholdings and stuff that's something you would contact payroll about um is social security taken out of my retirement benefit if i am not at the age of retirement el age eligible to receive social security no it is not they're two separate things so that does not benefit. This does not. Um, that does not have any effect to that. Uh, let's see. Wow, they're just popping up here. Okay. Um, let's see. My spouse is entitled to part of my retirement benefits. They do not have to be listed as a beneficiary, right? I can list my child. Child as a beneficiary. Um, 
So that that's an open ended question. So my spouse is entitled to part of my retirement. Is that an ex spouse and just did not list that? Um, because if an if it's an ex spouse, for example, has a is awarded a percentage of your benefit, then you can list your children as your beneficiary um, for the for the portion that you're uh, um, allowed to. But depending on the option that you select, that will determine what they could potentially receive. That that's how I'm interpreting that question right there. Um, what happens with your retirement if you're vested and pass away before you retire? Well, actually, let's go here and I'm going to show you that that slide here again. Okay. So to answer your question here is if you're vested and you happen to pass away before you retire, your beneficiary that you have listed has a couple of options to choose from. So they have three options. So option one, it could be any beneficiary. They can choose this option to get a return of all the contributions and interest that you put into the plan and up to six months of your salary. Um, the second and third options provide um, monthly survivor allowance benefits to a qualified beneficiary only. That is a spouse or a minor child. Option two is a monthly survivor's allowance benefit. Option three is a reduced monthly survivor's allowance benefit and up to six months of employee salary. So that kind of answers your question right there on that slide. The taxes are Fed, Fed, Med, EE, Fed, SDI, California withholding. Do these still come out during retirement? The only taxes that come out at retirement are federal withholding and California withholding. Or if you move to another state, if that state has tax withholding, that is taken out. Those are the only two things guaranteed to be taken out of your check are those two taxes. Uh, let's see. What is retirement miss sup? What is retirement supplement? I believe for yeah, I believe um, for like tier one, and I'm just speaking uh, on behalf of tier one. Um, there's a high rate and a low rate, so um, if you add those two combinations, I'm sorry, if you add the um, retirement uh, miscellaneous stuff and the retirement supplemental amount together, that'll be your contribution uh, that you pay biweekly towards retirement. It's just get broken up into uh, two uh, separate category for retirement. Am I understanding correctly? One must put in 10 years with the county and must be age 50 to retire. That, that is all based on the tier. So let me go to here to the retirement eligibility slide. So if you're in general tier one through four and safety tier one, two, and four, it's age 50 with 10 years of service. That's if you want to retire with the minimum retirement eligibility requirements. But keep in mind, those are just the minimum requirements. So that would so your benefit would be more minimal compared to if you were to work longer and retire at a later age. Uh, what is the average health cost for someone who retires prior to the age of 62? I don't have that information, honestly. Um, that uh, I would say most of the time that people that do retire before the age of 62 end up taking COBRA for a few years, and then they they get either Medicare or they find their own other supplemental insurance. Um, a lot of members tend to get COBRA through the county, so I would look at the employee benefits website to look at the retiree rates for 2021 to kind of get an idea. But as a recommendation for healthcare, like I mentioned, we don't deal, deal with anything like that in our department or for anything, anything, but just research all that stuff and find out what works for you. That's the best way. See, I do want to see a detailed explanation of the towel. We can do definitely do that later on. That will be coming. And then thank you for answering the change question. Awesome. So we have time for a couple more questions here. And then uh, we're going to just um, end the webinar here. But thank you guys for all hanging out. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh. Okay, so I see a link to our contributions page. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, the three options for beneficiary is our choice already documented or do we have to request it? So when you get for your beneficiary, we you get hired and you fill out an enrollment card and you're able to list a beneficiary to any one of your choosing. Now, if you end up doing that, 
um, you can change it at any time by just filling out the form and mailing it to our office. The choice is the choice is documented, but it's not already it's not set in stone. You have the option to change that. Now, if you're talking about as far as retirement options, those options you choose when you're ready to retire. And once you elect that option and sign paperwork, that option is set in stone and cannot be changed. Uh, let's see. Thank you again. We appreciate that. Um, these are all great questions. Is there any way that you can place the answers in the chat so we can refer to them after the webinar is over? Um, you know what? I will try and get all these, the chat log and questions written down somehow. And then what I can do is after the seminar is over, I'm going to send out a survey probably tomorrow or Monday. Send out a survey just to kind of give you give me feedback on how the seminar went and then what would you like to see of that nature. I can also try and include those questions in there as well. Um, is COBRA the same coverage as we have now? Does it get continued as is? That's something you must speak with employee benefits about. We don't make any jurisdiction about that. So contact employee benefits at 618.10. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you for uh, checking out the webinar today. We look forward to doing more of these for you all. Um, with that, I think that's kind of it for questions for today. Um, thank you all again for tuning into this webinar. We really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to be uploading this at a later time, and then I'm going to be emailing this out to all county just so they can view it. Um, I will be sending all the attendees a survey, like I mentioned, on Friday or Monday. Please fill out that survey. Just give me feedback of what you like, what you didn't like, so we can tweak this to make this webinar even better in the future, and then maybe add more stuff to it. Um, Oh, we have two more. Okay, so, oh, thank you for doing that, Donna. Okay, well, I'll answer this last one, and that's it. What is the formula for how TO, I'm assuming that's time off bank hours are converted to service them. I don't remember the formula off the top of my head. Um, I'll go ahead and, um, so the formula is the number of hours or the number of your time off bank hours divided by 80 hours times 14 days and then divided by 365 days. So I'll go ahead and um, answer it right now really quick. But again, like what Jared meant, what Jared said earlier, we're going to go ahead and um, answer all the questions and uh, we'll post it as well. And then um, Jared will be sending out um, this PowerPoint along with the Q&A to um, everyone. And yeah, many of you guys have any questions, any concerns, um, definitely, you know, write to us. Um, and yeah. <laughs> yes. So yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at the Facero webmail or you can email me personally. Um, um, I believe all you probably have my email since I'm the one that's been sending everything out. So you can email me personally if you have any questions. Um, but I want to just say again, thank you all for um, thank you all for checking out the webinar, and we are um, excited to be doing more of this stuff for you all. So um, again, have a good day, everybody. Stay safe out there, and have a good holiday. Thank you all so much. Bye. <laughs>